good afternoon uh, i am shantanu bhattacharya and i'll be your instructor for this course on the introduction to biomems and microsystems uh, let me introduce a little bit of what biomems really is biomems uh, is also in other words called bio micro electro mechanical systems uh, it is really about things which uh, do very useful and important things at a scale which is micro or sub micro in 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 uh, the regime so i would like to uh, discuss today uh, a few basics or few introductory concepts which are important for understanding this course uh, more properly so uh, let's go to um, have have a look at what definitionally micro nano systems can do uh, they are really systems made up of very small components micron or nanometer in scale uh, they have a relative high applicability uh, to the field of life sciences biotechnology and medicine which has uh, really started more uh, with you know the advent uh, of uh, uh, things called lab on chip technology uh, as i'll be describing later throughout uh, the course and uh, essentially one of the reasons why uh, these components rhyme so well with uh, life sciences based detection and diagnostics or biotechnology and medicine applications is because they really size uh, with similarly to some of the biological entities and uh, as uh, of late uh, the focus of uh, such microsystems research is gradually shifting to Uh, microfluidic systems so let us understand a little more of uh, uh, what definitionally biomems uh, can be laid out as so biomems really is the biological or biomedical application of mems technology and uh, there are few more important terms that i would like to discuss before starting one is bionanotechnology which is uh, the biological applications of nanotechnology science and technology uh, at the scale um, uh, you know uh, at the scale less than 100 nanometers is really what nanotechnology is and if we combine that to biological concepts then uh, it is uh, also known as bio nanotechnology microfluidics as uh, we'll be seeing later on throughout our module is uh, the study of fluid transport at microscopic lens scale and these concepts are really all very integrated uh, important to understand uh, the utility or the essence of biomems so let us have uh, a little more Uh, diagrammatic representation on what are these sizes and scales that i have been talking about so if you really look at uh, this uh, scale here um uh, the scale here on the left on your left here starts from uh, 0.1 nanometers all the way to about 100 microns and uh, let me be a little more specific on what 100, 100 microns would really look like a human hair diameter typically is that of about 100 micrometers okay so that's how small it is and 0.1 nanometers is several thousands of that dimension actually so you are dividing that or splitting that into almost uh, about uh, 10000 times in order to achieve something like 0.1 uh, nanometers now if you look at some of these entities here as uh, can be represented on the just just very next to the scale Uh, most of the plant and animal cells and this right here uh, is uh, actually a red blood cell uh, there are th millions of such cells within the human body uh, this is shaped like uh, something like a button okay and they uh, rhyme in the range of about 100 uh, to 10 microns uh, in fact a red blood cell the, the cm image of which is represented here is about uh, 20 microns or so if you go a little bit down uh, this cell for example this uh, here is uh, an e coli uh, an cm image of an e coli bacteria most bacterial cells uh, rhyme in the range of about 1 to 10 microns so they are at least a tenth smaller uh, or at least uh, a tenth smaller than uh, the mammalian cells the plant and animal cells uh, let's go a little bit down further here this uh, right here is uh, actually a virus uh, which is essentially nothing but a um a coat of uh, a capsid made up of proteins and enclosing some genomic information and uh, typically the sizes of these viruses are of the order of a few hundred nanometers uh if you go a little bit further down we have molecules like let's say proteins or dna and here something very interesting uh, dna is nothing but a twisted ladder so you take a ladder and kind of twist it and one helical turn of a dna is something like about 2 to 3 nanometers about 20 30 amstongs and uh, if you go a little bit down further uh, you have atoms and molecules and this really is an approach which is also uh, known as the bottom up approach or bottom up uh, uh, means of manufacturing uh, somehow we can illustrate this as as if mother nature has been making these higher forms from these lower ones which are principally atoms by uh, using concepts of self assembly and energy driven mechanics and so on and so forth 
so if you look at uh, the figures on the right here, uh, really uh, they are uh, things which are actually made uh, using the top-down approach, uh, which means that you have a bigger, much bigger size wafer or platform and you are trying to reduce it through micro-machining or technologies which we together know as micro-technology uh, and trying to make smaller and smaller sizes in, in, in the way. So if you look at this figure here, this illustrates actually nothing but a micro cantilever. So I call it something like diving board in a swimming pool, as if uh, there is a pool and there is a kind of you know board which is sticking out. And uh, the only difference here is that this board is about nothing but 200 to 300 nanometers thick. And they're projected about 10 to 50 microns ahead. And so the scale is just simply too, too, too very small. I go down a bit further. Uh, this right here is a very interesting example. It's a polysilicon gate with nitride spacing. Uh, and in, in fact, it is a commercially available device. Uh, and so if we look at uh, the ITRS roadmap, uh, the International uh, Semiconductor Technology Roadmap, uh, it mentions that uh, by the year 2004 actually, uh, which was about three to four years back, the transistor, uh, the minimum feature size on a transistor was close to about uh, 100 nanometers uh, and uh, it has even reduced now further. For such a device, um, the, the gate insulator which is actually uh, something like you know uh, a packing between the, uh, it's, a, it's like a dielectric material between uh, the metal contact and the actual device. That insulator is about 2 to 3 nanometers. So why I'm showing you all this is that if you really compare these uh, features and objects on a size scale they very well rhyme with each other. Like for example, uh, as I told you, viruses is about a few hundred, micro, uh, few, few hundred nanometers and, and you can really with micro and nanotechnology produce features like a polysilicon gate which is of the same range. Okay, molecules are even a little bit further uh, down and that rhymes very well with this gate insulator. So uh, this size comparison uh, kind of allows us uh, the luxury of bringing these two worlds close together so that uh, there can be uh, their accurate sensing, detection, diagnostics, so on and so forth. So that's why bio-MEMS, okay. And uh, if you look at some of these uh, uh, kind of modules or, uh, you know, figures here, this represents uh, the basic schematic of how this MEMS can be laid out on a simple, uh, let's say, 2D CMOS platform. So it's a combination of different uh, concepts like molecular devices and memory, uh, you know, uh, MEMS and NEMS technology, microfluidic systems, and uh, then microelectronics, and you combine everything together to form something which can sense or diagnose these life-size entities uh, very sensitively and accurately uh, in this area of, of bio-MEMS. And so because of that, you can develop <laughs> these kind of approaches uh, and call them integrated biochips at the micro, macro, and nano scale. And uh, this could be very useful uh, as we'll see throughout the lectures later how uh, there can be various applications of such architectures or such technologies. So one thing very important to mention here is that because these life uh, type of entities uh, tend to be happy within fluidic environments, therefore uh, for their accurate diagnostics or detection, it is very important for uh, the, the entities to be in actually fluids. Okay, and uh, we should prepare fluidics in a manner which can again rhyme very well with their sizes so that we can have concepts like, you know, a single cell by single cell transfer or trying to isolate, you know, molecules on a, on a plate or surface. So therefore, the concept of micro nano fluidics emerges from there. So these are all really integrated together and it's very important for understanding uh, a simple intuitive engineering design, I would say, for uh, doing something uh, with more precision, rapidity, accuracy, so on and so forth. So I really put this whole field uh, as, um, uh, it's, it's as, as a synergistic learning experience between uh, the areas of micro nanotechnology and systems and biology and biomedicine. And, uh, you know, really uh, these, these technologies or these systems uh, are bio-inspired in a sense uh, that there is a to and fro learning uh, between biology and this, this technique. So if you look at this figure here, it more clearly illustrates this idea. So here, if you see uh, the, the circle in the center here, it represents these two areas of micro nanotechnology and systems and biology and biomedicine. And if you see, there are these two arrows on both sides where they are showing that what can be learned from what. So if you look at the boxes on the left, like diagnostics, biochips, quantum dots, silicon nanowires, 
carbon nanotubes. These are really some of the uh, some of the technologies that we can apply to biology and biomedicine, and we can learn from the micro nanotechnology and systems. Similarly, you have areas like therapeutics, uh, drug release, targeted delivery. Nowadays, there is a huge impetus of how microscopic. Uh, quantities or minuscule quantities of drugs can be injected. How do you do that? So you have uh, a very good learning experience from micro nanotechnology and systems and try to realize dimensions and features in a manner that this is doable. Okay, the miniaturized de fluid delivery is doable. Okay, uh, another very interesting area is this hybrid bio devices. Nowadays, there are uh, these whole initiatives of tissue engineering. You can develop something like an artificial heart or artificial kidney or an artificial liver. So essentially this is nothing but um, an approach where you st try to utilize some of the learning experiences from micro nanotechnology and system and apply it directly to make artificial organs maybe. The boxes here on the right are actually a reverse process of learning. That means uh, they are based on concepts where learning is borrowed from biology and biomedicine and applied onto my micro nanotechnology and systems. And uh, you can see some of the examples as the self assembly. Uh, DNA or protein mediated. So I will be describing a little bit details uh, later what a DNA structure looks like or how it actually self assembles. But uh, the DNA is a unique uh, kind of entity which is able to um, you know it is able to kind of um, pack together in a certain shape or feature or pattern and uh, it really uh, gives us a lot of inspiration or a lot of learning. So, from the, uh, the zeal or vigor with which the two strands of a DNA which are complementary to each other kind of self assemble and stitch on each other's base pairs, we could have a lot of learning which we can apply to really micro and nanotechnology. Okay. So, self assembled monolayers as a matter of fact are another area where uh, you know from just from basic elemental chemistry uh, we could make micro nano patterns or features or heaps of these molecules over. Uh, the different uh, parts of a surface uh, and, and that could realize micro nano domain or micro nano features uh, from learning borrowed from biology and biomedicine. Similarly, another very fascinating area is this molecular electronics <laughs> where uh, we talk about a single molecule uh, being able to conduct uh, current between two posts which are placed one molecule apart or maybe a single DNA and uh, there are a lot of interesting work in this area. Uh, we say is that you know if you have DNA as a wire which is connecting between two posts and just simply use it as a as a just a you know um, a resistive circuit okay it, it just follows V equal to IR relationship. However, in this case uh, as uh, you know the GC content or the or the guanine cytosine content of the DNA is increased you see that there is a change in conductivity so on so forth. So, there is a huge effort of uh, using these some of these entities towards uh, transferring charges very sensitively at a very small scale and this could be immensely contributing to the field of micro nanotechnology. Similarly, human skin it is a very interesting example I mean we call it bio inspired material just think about how important uh, the human skin is uh, and what kind of properties does it have it can self heal it can respond it can do all sort of you know um, uh, repairing self repairing uh, kind, kind of uh, things. Uh, automatically and uh, if we really want to replicate something like human skin uh, that would be a fascinating assay of micro nanotechnology where uh, probably millions of sensors are packed on to a surface and each of these sensor has a different job. So I really call these uh, areas that the, the inspirational learning from micro nanotechnology to biology and biomedicine would be able to develop novel solutions for some of the frontiers in medicine and biology. And similarly, uh, the learning experience that we have from biology and biomedicine would be able to uh, develop some novel solutions for frontiers in material and information processing. Okay. So, it is really a synergism which exists between these two areas and therefore, uh, it is also in the best interest to integrate uh, the area of bio with these micro nano systems and uh, uh, thus these terminologies as we have been describing like biomems, bio nanotechnology, etc. automatically self emerge because of this. Uh, mechanisms. <coughs> Let us see what can these kind of micro systems really do in biology and this is uh, uh, a slide which I really keep on illustrating time and again. Uh, it gives an a sense of what kind of uh, applications are really available and some of them mind you are really commercially available applications as I will be illustrating. So, this here as you see is, uh, is nothing but a neuro probe. Uh, it is developed by uh, Dr. Weiss's group at the University of Michigan and Arbor. 
And uh, essentially, uh, if you see, this is again a very fine example of micro nanotechnology, wherein this particular feature is probably of the size of just a few microns. And there are these uh, small, small, uh, as you see here, these small, small wires which are printed by just uh, lithographic processes onto such, such a probe. And uh, this probe is used for um, electrical, uh, the electrical uh, monitoring the electrical activity of brain cells or brain tissues. Now, b b why micro technology is required in that is that if you think about a neurosurgeon who is actually uh, just operating on somebody's, uh, you know, uh, the cranium portion and he wants to inject a, inject a big tool which can just do electrical response monitoring. Uh, it is not a very feasible option, you know, the, the, the patient would suffer a lot of pain. Uh, there would be uh, a, general, uh, a general tendency of uh, uh, unnecessary damage which may have uh, a long consequence in terms of the patient's post-surgical health and a lot of other issues are considered. Now, if instead of that you replace the whole uh, electrical sensing tip with a very small micro needle which can just go into a very small area of the cranium and uh, do the same job as a big tip would be doing, uh, then that gives really the utility or a sense of such a technology. Uh, this again is a very fine example. Uh, it is uh, uh, basically uh, a very long slender uh, like probe, neuro probe developed at Stanford and uh, it's essentially used for uh, giving deep electrical stimulation to especially patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. Uh, this uh, area again is a very fascinating area and I uh, call it uh, probably the future in the area of uh, biomems or biotechnology. This is essentially a set of neuron cells which are uh, growing on um, uh, an array of MOSFETs. You can see uh, these uh, here are the cells and they are growing on uh, a set of MOS transistors. Okay. Uh, this area is also known as by the by nanobiology. Now, uh, think about that the signaling between these cells and uh, I would go into a little bit details of biology later as we go along this area. Essentially, these cells grow in a very unique manner with there is a lot of uh, signaling pathway between the two uh, which uh, would certify or which would signify uh, the behavior of such cells. Okay. So, if, uh, if we can study uniquely on a single cell basis, what are those signaling pathways in terms of maybe exchange of ions or chemicals between these two cells? And this is of immense utility to in general, uh, you know, understanding life processes as such. Okay. So, there is a huge initiative now how to study these cells on a single cell basis and try to illustrate what kind of chemical reactions on the surface or within the cells is going on and what kind uh, of communication is going on between such cells which would relate to uh, their behavior in general. Again, this is a very good example that you know I almost always keep on mentioning. This is uh, a micro needle and uh, this comes from a very common life experience. So, the needle of a mosquito is uh, essentially uh, when, when a mosquito bites you, you do not really feel the pain. Uh, what happens is that as uh, the needle goes into the skin, the needle of a mosquito goes into your skin, uh, there is a, uh, a post injection swelling which comes up. That swelling is not because of any uh, you know, pain effects or, or any effects because of the needle pricking it. That is essentially because uh, the, when the mosquito actually tries to draw blood, it releases some enzymes uh, which kind of tries to thin the blood sample and uh, that is so it becomes very easy for it to withdraw the blood sample in this manner. But uh, again, uh, the fact is that when the needle goes into the skin, uh, it hardly makes any difference to the skin. Okay, you do not feel any pain. And the reason why pain is really felt in the, in the human skin is because that there are, if you look at the skin really uh, beyond, you know, about uh, let us say 100 microns of uh, a, a layer of dead cells, which we also known as the, the epithelium, uh, there, there starts a set of, uh, you know, there is, there is a set of receptors called pain receptors, which are nerve endings essentially. And uh, the mosquito's needle is so thin that it goes into this 100 micron and goes uh, very close to that, uh, that uh, region of uh, pain receptors, but it is hardly able to deflect or damage some of these receptors. So, there is no pain sensation. Okay. And the mosquito does its job, it uh, goes into one of the vasculatures, picks up blood samples and then, uh, you know, uh, it kind of feeds itself 
on that basis. So the same principle has been used uh, using this, uh, borrowing this inspiration from micro nano, uh, from the biology and biomedicine to make what you call micro needles. Okay, this right here is a is an illustration of uh, what a micro needle really means. Okay, if you look at this needle, it is something close in dimensions to that that of a mosquito. And uh, there is in fact a com uh, commercial company called Cometrix which sells uh, s uh, thousands of these needles on something like a patch which you really wind around uh, the, uh, the patient's hands and uh, it can do things like you know parallel processing or in including monitoring of analytes inside the blood sample, drawing up samples from time to time etc. So it is a fascinating example of what micro nanotechnology can do uh, by replicating biology or getting bio inspired and do something useful and important. This again is a very interesting and fascinating example of what we call bio chip or lab on chip and I am going to come to it this uh, in just about a minute in more details about what biochips really are. So essentially <laughs> these are um, you know protocols uh, where uh, whatever is uh, possible within a laboratory is all miniaturized down to a single chip scale okay and uh, in terms of handling very small droplets or, or micro liters of fluidic volumes uh, you quickly and rapidly do whatever a laboratory does on a much bigger scale. So this is also known as uh, lab on a chip okay, or biochip and uh, a lot of research uh, wherein integration of electronics, optics, um, a lot of different transduction techniques are taking place uh, into a densely integrated uh, a platform uh, which is also known as biochip or you know lab on a chip kind of mechanism. This again is a very fantastic example of what can micro nanotechnology do in biology. And these here are those diving board in a swimming pool kind of structures as you see these are micro cantilevers okay. And uh, essentially uh, the scale here if you see is only 250 microns which means that they are projected about let us say about 3 times that size about um, 750 microns. But if you look at their thicknesses really they are about a tenth which is about let us say about 300 nanometers or so. And uh, interestingly <laughs> there are several of these uniquely uh, positioned and spaced uh, small small cantilever devices uh, available to uh, this edge of this particular uh, let us say piece of uh, material uh, which can be silicon okay. And what it essentially does is uh, it is nothing but a mass detector okay. So if you are able to somehow immobilize some cells or some molecules on the top of this particular uh, structure of cantilevers uh, due to the weight uh, that that is somehow immobilized onto the top there is a deflection and bending and from the deflection and bending you could back calculate uh, by using an equation called the Stoney's equation and I will be doing details of these a little bit later uh, the mass of the particular entity. However the advantage here is that because of the small uh, size of this cantilever uh, the, the resolution up to which you can really pick up masses go up to the order of about femto grams you know pico to femtograms and that is what gives the uniqueness of applications of microsystems in biology. So uh, we have been discussing uh, earlier about microfluidics and we have been um, really learning it as important because uh, we are talking about biological entities and typically all biological entities are um, uh, happy when they are in fluidic environments. But uh, it, is, it is very interesting that you know the behavior of fluidics at this particular scale, the micron scale uh, really is very very counter intuitive to any person who is trained in the macroscopic fluid behavior in any engineering curriculum okay. And uh, as I earlier indicated that the definition of microfluidics really is the transport of fluid at the microscopic length scale. Uh, and uh, there are some unique properties and changes which happen uh, because uh, of the scale change. One of the properties which is very very important to be mentioned is that the surface effects become prominent with high surface area to volume ratio. And uh, if you look at if uh, just dimensionally uh, the, if you just compare the surface area to the volume uh, it can be represented as L square by L cube right which is about L to the power of minus 1. So if this L is going to the micron level 
micrometer level, which is nothing but about 10 to the power of minus 6 meters, you can just think about that the, you know, the surface area becomes so much, so much more prominent with respect to the volume. It becomes about 10 to the power of 6 times more prominent with respect to the volume. So you have some forces or some effects which are related more towards the surface. They gain much more in prominence in comparison to uh, the volume forces. In case of fluids, volume forces could be something like, uh, you know, inertia. It could be something like just acceleration due to gravity of a small fluid mass, okay. And uh, these are also packed together as inertial effects essentially, um, you know, uh, the, the pressure driven aspect of flow. Uh, which is concerned with the, uh, the mass of the fluid flow. And uh, surface area on the other hand is something where uh, there could be forces of surface tension which is just related to uh, what is the length you know uh, of interface of fluid with respect to some other particular uh, boundary okay or maybe viscous forces where uh, surface area becomes more prominent. So as the surface area related activities or events become prominent in this case therefore um, you know the, uh, the, uh, the viscous forces or surface tension related forces are much more uh, into question and these are uh, critical parameters for designing such devices over uh, the general macroscopic idea of designing devices on the basis of uh, volume based flows. <coughs> Another very interesting effect here is uh, because of the low thermal mass and high heat transfer. We are talking about a miniaturized droplet size, okay, in terms of a few microliters of volume. And therefore, uh, it is very easy to probably conclude that it has uh, a very low thermal mass, that is number one. And essentially, uh, because of this low thermal mass, uh, there would be a high heat transfer. There are initiatives uh, inside microfluidic devices wherein some of these fluids are tried to make into a thin layer on the surface. Okay. So, if you look at uh, that instead of making a thick layer and more volume based, you are making more surface based and thinner layer. And how you make that is again what BioMEMS tells you. Okay. BioMEMS technology, BioMEMS fabrication technology tells you. So, essentially you are taking the whole fluid over a huge surface and therefore trying to increase the heat transfer rate. Another very interesting factor is the low Reynolds number. Uh, Reynolds number as we all know uh, is the ratio of viscous and inertial forces and essentially uh, you can also represent it as rho uh, u l by mu as you can see here. Okay, where rho is the density of the fluid which is flowing, u is the velocity, l is the corresponding length scale and mu um, is essentially the viscosity of the medium. Okay. So, uh, also uh, you can actually make this into um, mu by rho and make this dynamic viscosity of the material. Okay. Now, uh, low Reynolds number really uh, is typically uh, a, a certain domain of microfluidics. You know, there are a lot of changes because of this low Reynolds number value. Number one change which happens is uh, we can consider this as let us say a pack of cars. Okay. So, you have about hundreds of cars which is moving in a very small street which is uh, uh, you know maybe in peak traffic hour in uh, our city here. And uh, what would happen? What do you think would happen if such a situation happens? Uh, the cars would try to move in an aligned manner in more like streamlined fashion without really much crisscrossing because you are packing a lot of cars together. Number one, the velocity uh, of, the, of the car would also go down and then even if we assume that there is a high velocity, there is always a tendency of cars to move one beneath or one behind another and there would be hardly any people who would trying to, who would be trying to act smart and change their lanes, okay. Because that essentially means a collision or a, or a chaos or, a, or an accident. Okay. So, therefore, uh, if we just can compare a similar analogy in terms of molecules which we are compressing to a very small street or a very thin area, these molecules also tend to move in something called streamlines wherein uh, they would move parallel to each other without many of them really venturing to go into each other's tracks and colliding with each other. Okay. So, therefore, uh, the very unfortunate or maybe in some situations fortunate, I will be illustrating later these exam with examples. Uh, fact is that these molecules tend to remain in their own paths without really going across parallel tracks or paths. 
a situation where mixing becomes hardly, I mean, you know, it becomes impo almost next to impossible until and unless, as we will see later, there are diffusive forces which let these molecules crisscross on the basis of concentration gradients between the two flows. Just to illustrate this fact, I have kind of borrowed uh, <coughs> uh, an example from Whiteside's group here, as you see. And uh, essentially, this is a simulation which uh, talks about uh, there are a set of these. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, around 6 dyes of different colors which are flowing or which are being flowed in a microscopic dimension. And uh, they go in this manner and uh, there are several of these tracks which are emanating from different areas. And as you see these uh, fluids kind of go by together, there is um, a unique tendency of the colors to get separated without getting mixed. Okay. So, this red color which was injected here is as it is retrieved after a while. Uh, this blue color is as it is retrieved after some while. Similarly, this dark blue color is again retrieved after some while and the colors seldom mix and this is really a real time simulation and this is what happens in the micro scale also where you can see that the fluids although flowing parallelly hardly tend to mix because of the low Reynolds number value. So, just for illustration, <coughs> RE in BioMEMS devices, Reynolds number in BioMEMS devices is uh, usually less than about 100. And often, uh, or actually most often, they are less than about 0 0.1 or so. So, we will talk a little bit of sensors now because uh, this would be uh, important for um, uh, understanding say, essentially the purpose of a BioMEMS device is to, is to really sense something, okay. sense uh, or detect something uh, with uh, some degree of accuracy. So, definitionally, if we look at what sensors is, sensors really is uh, a device uh, uh, that detects or measures a physical, chemical or biological property or entity and records or indicates or responds to it. Okay. So, essentially it would uh, be used for some kind of a measurement. Measurement could be of a physical property. Physical property uh, could be something like uh, temperature, distance mass uh, of, uh, of, of an object, uh, the pressure in a particular channel, these are all physical properties. Okay. And so, therefore, uh, a sensor can be something which detects a physical property and those sensors are known as physical sensors as is illustrated here. Uh, it could detect uh, chemical properties and chemical substances uh, wherein things like maybe the chemical nature of an analyte or uh, you know the the chemical or physical responses of a, of, of a substance to an environment is recorded. <coughs> uh, so, these uh, type of sensors are also, also, also known as chemical sensors. And then finally, we have biological sensors which uh, monitors or measures the chemical substances uh, using biological sensing elements. Okay. So, essentially there is always an integration between uh, what chemistry has to offer and what biology has to do. Okay, but the idea is that um, you can classify some of those chemical sensors as biosensors if uh, the detection element uh, is actually more like a biological sensing element. So, that is what biosensors would do. So, essentially schematically uh, we can really in a very organized manner represent a sensor as something uh, which is going to detect this analyte or substrate which is present in this region and uh, for detecting it you have something called uh, a detection element which can be either chemical in nature or biological in nature and then the detection element has a change in property. Okay. So, it may be a change in chemical property, it may be a change in optical property, it may be a change in electrical property. And Essentially, uh, this, this element uh, uh, which is there for the detection purpose has a change in property uh, in, in the presence of the analyte or the substrate of interest. Okay. And it generates something called a signal and the signal can be further transduced by this particular element here which is also an integral part of the sensor. And what does transduction really mean? Transduction is essentially nothing but uh, a change of signal uh, from one form to another. So, if you have a chemical agent there, it is going to change into an electrical signal okay, or an optical signal. So, this is called transduction. Transduction is a change in signal of one kind to another. So, you have an element here on the biosensors as you see here, uh, which does this transduction. So, whatever signal is generated from the biological 
detection element or the chemical detection element in the presence of the analyte or substrate is transduced into a signal of some form and the signal is essentially fed into a processor uh, which would be uh, trying to read, analyze, interpret the signal and trying to conclude whether there is uh, an analyte of interest present or absent or in what quantities these analyte of interests are present and so the, together this thing is uh, can be defined as uh, an organized schematic of what a chemical or a biosensor would do. Let me give you an example. Okay, <coughs> The laboratory level litmus paper uh, is something that probably all of you have used uh, in your school days and what essentially happens is that if you uh, expose this paper to a variety of pHs that means a variety of acidic or basic uh, fluids uh, it changes uh, its coloration okay so uh, there is a change in the absorption wavelength uh, of light because of which you can find a different color appearing uh, based on um, uh, different pHs so uh, there are now commercially available litmus papers where there are a range of colorations which are illustrated for even uh, having a resolution almost 1.0 pH change. So, you can at all different pHs get a different absorption spectrum and the color. So, this is the finest example of a sensor or maybe something like a pH indicated electrode where you dip an electrode in a, a, a material and that electrode has a change in electrical property which is signifying what is the hydrogen ion concentration of a particular medium. So, these are examples of sensors, okay, uh, chemical sensors. So, let us try to illustrate this simple litmus paper or pH indicator electrode as a sensor model. So, you have an analyte which is a solution right in which the pH is to be measured it can be a basic or an acidic pH. You have a detection element and in case of a litmus paper it is a chemical dye and uh, in case of a pH electrode it is a set of chemicals of course and uh, <coughs> this chemical dye what it does is it does a transduction that means when it is exposed to an acid or a pH of certain you know kind. Uh, it rapidly changes its absorption spectrum. Uh, so, therefore, as you know as the absorption spectrum is changed there is a change in coloration of uh, a particular material. So, it changes color okay. and the change in color is because of the chemical dye getting exposed to a certain level of hydrogen ions and it has been calibrated in a manner that if you have x concentration you will have a different color, if you have y concentration you have a different color and so there is a certain scale on which this, this can be mentioned in terms of a color scale. So, that is what the transduction element is okay. and in case of a litmus paper uh, the human eye which observes these coloration changes is nothing but the signal processor. Okay. So, it is essentially the measuring device which, uh, which tells you that what color corresponds to what pH by looking at a calibrated scale which has been done before by somebody and which is mentioned in all these packs of litmus papers and you are just comparing the color through your eye to the color that is on the scale. So, that is essentially the signal processor. Similarly, <coughs> uh, if you look at the pH electrode, the set of chemicals inside the pH electrode is the detection element and uh, the change in voltage which is generated by, uh, by the electrode uh, is essentially uh, a ways and means of chemical to electrical transduction. So, whatever uh, solution you are trying to gauge, uh, that solution is essentially uh, measured by putting the, 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 the electrode inside and there is a change in voltage or potential because of that. Okay. So, the transduction is from chemical that means generated by the hydrogen ions in a particular solution of a particular pH to a voltage. Uh, so, it is essentially a potentiometric sensor as we will uh, study in a little bit detail later on. Okay. <coughs> and then the signal processor in this device is really a meter which can read what is the change in the voltage. Okay. So, that can be an electronic meter which can do that reading and therefore, <coughs> you can also illustrate the electrode as an analyte which is the acid or the chemical uh, of whose uh, pH is to be measured, uh, set of chemicals inside the pH electrode as the detection element and then uh, the chemical to voltage change is the transduction process and the measuring device has the meter which eventually reads the voltage change. So, that is how so, as we were have been talking about sensors, uh, let us actually uh, look at some of the interesting uh, sensors that human body has. Human nose as a matter of fact is uh, one of the most uh, important sensors that the human body has or in fact our eyes uh, can be illustrated as a sensor model. So, I would like to look a little bit into how a human nose functions uh, especially because it is a um, you know a bio area and there is substantial amount of 
life sciences aspect in it, one should know really how our body uh, can be adjudged or how our body can be uh, laid out in uh, different senses of our body can be laid out as sensors. Okay. So, <laughs> this essentially is what uh, the, the internal view of um, the nasal tract would look like in a human body. And uh, but let's first illustrate the functionality aspect. Uh, so, what do we really need uh, uh, the nose for? So, there is air which has uh, oxygen, um, which is essentially an oxygen rich component and we have to uh, take this, intake this air for our survival. And uh, the first thing that this air uh, has to do is to get pre-filtered. Okay. So, as it enters the nasal, nasal tract here, there are set of these, uh, as you see here in this region, there are these, these hair like entities which are able to kind of pre-filter whatever particulate the air has if for just cleaning it before entering the human body. Once uh, the air goes inside, it actually touches a set of bifurcated blood vessel network in this region, uh, also known as the olfactory mucus uh, region, where uh, there is a membrane which does two-fold objectives. One is that it warms up uh, the air which you have taken in and uh, then it makes it a little bit moistened so that it adjusts to the internal conditions of the lungs into which the air is directly sent in after passing through it. So, it becomes warm and it becomes a little moist. Okay, so, that is how uh, the nose operates. Now, the very interesting factor in the nose is what we know as the sense of smell. Okay. Uh, how does really uh, sense of smell occur? If we look at it, it is nothing but a signal transduction process. And uh, as we know that uh, we can really classify something called smell uh, into different classes uh, like pungent, sweaty, rotten, uh, sweet, so on and so forth, depending on whatever the, the ambient is. And uh, uh, really if you look at what is going on, uh, smell is a result of uh, thousands or actually millions of chemical reactions uh, which take place at surfaces of very fine uh, hair like moieties called cilia uh, essentially in the in this olfactory cells uh, which are in this this particular area okay so uh, or in this area as a matter of fact so there are these fine hair like uh, cilia uh, uh, kind of moieties on the cell surface where thousands of chemical reactions are taking place by the input air that comes in which classifies a smell as pungent, sweaty, rotten, sweet, so on and so forth. So, <coughs> essentially this hair like structure is about 12 percent by volume of uh, the whole olfactory membrane. So, that is how small it is and uh, this is kind of an illustration of the smaller it is the better it is. Okay. Uh, which is uh, the driving lesson for micro nanotechnology. Uh, so, just to give you some facts and figures, the tissue in the olfactory region has more than 10 million receptor cells which have these hair like moieties and uh, it's about 50 microns thick than the normal epithelium layer. So, the epithelium layer uh, that we have in our body is about 100 microns. So, the, the total thickness of this particular uh, uh, you know the olfactory region is about 150 microns or so. And it contains about 300 distinct genes uh, which encode um, the olfactory receptor proteins which make up the cilia. Okay. So, the cilia that we are talking about where these thousands of chemical reactions are going on are made of, of some protein molecules and uh, they are coded by about 300 different genes uh, inside these, these olfactory cells and uh, it is a self emerging process. So, as there is a, some transduction of uh, let us say some kind of a reaction, a, a, a chemical reaction into an electronic impulse which goes through your uh, bundle of nerves which are connected at the back end of these olf olfactory cells like this you know to your brain. So, essentially it is an electronic impulse which is going because of this electrochemical process which is happening on the uh, surface of a cilia and so, so basically the, the, the protein that is changing its classification is continuously being updated or typed by the distinct genes which are available inside these cells. So, it is a continuous process. Okay. So, there are new moieties every time where new reactions would take place and because of that new electrons would be generated and the electron flow is a continuous process which goes to the brain and that 
uh, classifies again based on the response that you get something as too pungent or too sweet or uh, some rotten or sweaty kind of um, sensations. So, there are some categories. So, therefore, uh, if I really, really like to look at a human sense, uh, the, the human nose as a sensor model, it is uh, containing a biological detection element. Uh, which is working on a sample of interest here which is nothing but the, the air sample and the biological detection element in our case is this olfactory membrane this uniquely uh, made or you know crafted tissue which gives you uh, a transduction from chemical to electrical and the electrical impulse is taken by the nerve cell is in forms of an electrical signal all the way to the microprocessor that we have in our body the signal processor which is the brain in this case. So, really human nose can be uh, categorized as an artificial uh, sensor ok. Well, Let us look at eyes, uh, eyes are typically uh, a very important constituents of, uh, of the human body uh, which takes up light and is able to distinguish or identify between objects and uh, this is how it works. So, the cornea in the eye as can be illustrated in this particular uh, figure here is the equivalent to uh, the lens cover of a camera ok. So, let us uh, kind of try to analog uh, provide an analogy between the cornea or, or, or the lens or the, or the whole eye structure uh, and, uh, and a mechanical a simple simple camera you know uh, an optical device essentially. So, uh, the lens cover here maybe in this region is equivalent to something which we call the cornea ok and uh, rays which come uh, and strike. Uh, the cornea kind of get bent uh, through this region called the pupil region which is just immediately uh, behind the cornea and focuses on to the lens ok the eye lens. The eye lens further focuses these uh, rays into the back end of the eye which is this particular membrane here which is also known as the retina ok. So, the, the it is pretty much same as you have these lenses here as you see in the camera you have a lens cover which is the cornea and these lenses focus uh, the light ray into something called the film into which uh, the response is recorded in terms of uh, an optical signal. So, the back end of the eye is really uh, the, the center uh, where responses can be converted from optical into electrical and we will learn in a little bit how uh, that happens. So, essentially uh, the photoreceptor nerve cells of the retina. Uh, change light rays into electrical responses and send them through the brain to the brain through uh, the optic nerves uh, and and there is a chemical electrochemical transduction process which happens uh, there is a compound called cis retinal uh, which changes into its transform giving uh, an electron uh, which goes into the brain and causes a sensation because of that. So, the human eye in, in, in a nutshell is a fascinating sensor it accommodates uh, to changing light conditions automatically. Uh, uh, there is a contraction or expansion uh, in this in this receiving part of the eye due to which the light can be focused onto uh, you know the retina and uh, uh, or for, for, for light emanating from various distances uh, placed close or far away from the eye you have a different focusing aspect of the lens which can accurately focus it every time onto the retina irrespective of how far or how near the object is. So, it is essentially again <laughs> um, an interesting sensor model. So, if we put this whole thing together as a sensor device, so uh, the analyte of interest here really is the light signal which we are trying to detect. The biological detection element here are the nerve cells on the retina as uh, we have been talking about and uh, the, the, the transducer here is the retinol which we are just coming in a little bit and uh, so there is a conversion of uh, the light really uh, passing through this biological detection element into an electrical signal which goes through these optic nerves into the brain and thus uh, the brain here essentially is the signal processor and it detects and changes uh, according to the response that it gets. So, what happens essentially in the transducer let us look at uh, this molecular structure here uh, called cis retinal uh, is illustrated here. So, the transduction takes place um, um, again through, through a molecule called rhodopsin which is essentially an opsin protein uh, and is covalently linked to this compound called 11 cis isomer uh, of uh, retinal ok. And whenever light falls on it the cis retinal is converted into its trans form the cis converts into a trans retinal form uh, which is a slight change in orientation there is essentially a, 
a changeover of uh, uh, a part of the molecule and uh, what it generates is an extra electron okay and that electron is uh, what causes sensation so the whole retina is split up into into millions of cells each of which is essentially a work center where there is a change in these compound retinal from cis to trans form and that generates an impulse or a signal which is also known as light now this light can be of various intensities based on how many electrons are really generated um, and goes into the optic nerve so human eye again is is a fascinating sensor on which uh, one can really think of <coughs> so when we look at the various aspects for sensor design and i would like to first illustrate this point very well because uh, again the uh, the purpose of biomems devices is really sensing or diagnosing um uh, some some of the things or some of the analytes of interest so what all aspects go into sensor design there are four different uh, broad areas into which it can be categorized one are what is the recognition element really is it a is it a biological uh, uh, element is it um, is it a physical element what exactly is recognizing uh, the analyte of interest or uh, the object of interest which has to be sensed what is the transduction type uh what exactly the transduction type is is it a chemical to electrical is it a is it a, a chemical to optical is it an electrochemical process and <coughs> then we have a, a very important issue called methods of immobilization uh, which means that this recognition element has to be immobilized onto the sensor surface so there are different ways and means of doing that so that is another aspect when we consider sensor design and then finally uh, we are left with these performance factors of the sensor uh, wherein we gauge how effective uh, the sensor would be uh, and is it really doing its job in the manner that it is supposed uh, or it's designed to do for so we will study these aspects one by one and uh, go a little bit more into recognition elements so Uh, what really recognition elements are so recognition elements as i as i told you uh, before are elements which would impart the selectivity uh, enabling the sensor to respond selectively to a particular analyte avoiding the interference from other substances okay so if there are more than one analytes in a solution and you want to investigate a certain analyte over the others the recognition element is something which would give the selectivity of measuring what you want to measure as opposed to the other five components maybe or six components which are just present there okay and so therefore some examples of this recognition element could be things like let's say in an ion selective electrode you have a membrane which is selective for the analyte of interest so essentially there is a membrane which would pick and choose uh, the particular ion of interest uh, into picture okay so that is what uh, uh, the recognition element would be or in pro uh, probably in biosensors these could be um, uh, biological moieties like enzymes antibodies uh, nucleic acids receptors etc so we will be studying this off and on in details later that let's say for example if it is a glucose biosensor there is an enzyme called glucose oxidase we also in a short form we call it god or god uh, which converts uh, glucose into gluconic acid and h2o2 so if you are having a ph based sensor to monitor the, the increase in the hydrogen ion concentration you will see that there is a steep increase because of formation of h2o2 as the god catalyzes the process and converts gluconic acid okay so but the recognition element there is nothing but that enzyme and so there is a very important aspect that what that element would be which can select a specific uh, chemical of interest over the others so uh, therefore you know this as i was telling that the recognition element is is very important for uh, any sensor essentially so let me give you an illustration of what some of this element would look like okay this uh, is is a, a, a diagnostics or a detection process known as elisa uh, which you also known as uh, known as enzyme linked immunosorbent assays so let's look at step by step uh, what happens in in such a mechanism or such a such a diagnostic protocol here it is essentially the play of an enzyme it's it's uh, the play of an enzyme which cause a change in uh, color or change in the absorption spectrum of the particular media which lets you know whether there is presence or absence of the antigen of interest inside or or the analyte of interest inside uh, the blood of the particular patient 
So, if you look at the various steps here, so you take something called a plate in which the antigens and I uh, will just in a minute come to what antigens are, uh, HIV antigens are immobilized. You see these particular, uh, you know, these moieties which are present here, they are HIV antigens. So, antigens are a set of chemicals uh, which uh, come as, as a response of uh, a pathogenic attack within the human body. The, the first line of chemicals which are generated inside the, inside the body uh, are nothing but these antigens which show or signify the presence or absence uh, of uh, a particular you know um, attacking species okay, which may be detrimental to the, to the health or overall uh, physiological setup of a particular being. Okay. So, uh, there are these, uh, these antigens which are coated on this particular plate here and we essentially take the serum of the patient who is probably going to be diagnosed for HIV as positive or negative and uh, as we know that the first line of defense within the human body is our human immune system and whenever there is a, some kind of a uh, you know an, an, an antigenic attack, uh, the first line of defense generates chemicals or moieties called antibodies which would try to go and bind and cleave or block some of these attacking species and, and they do very well with the antigens, okay. they bond very well with the, the antigens. So, we drop the blood into this particular uh, coated antigens and assuming that there are uh, the patient is positive and there is uh, an immune response which has happened, uh, there is a tendency of some of these antibodies to get bonded onto these immobilized antigens. Uh, the unbonded ones are washed away later on and so you have only these bonded ones to the antigens and the antigens are immobilized that means they are chemically somehow uh, attached to the surface of interest in this case which is actually a petri dish and uh, here the antigens as you are seeing is getting bonded. So, the unbonded ones are actually typically washed off uh, this surface. Then we add a secondary antibody which would bind to this primary antibody but the only difference in this particular secondary antibody is that you have an, an enzyme. Uh, of a certain kind conjugated onto the secondary. Okay. So, uh, essentially these two chemicals as you are seeing here by the blue arrow uh, or, or by this blue feature and this red feature, they are conjugates of each other. So, they can bind very well. Okay. So, this is a secondary antibody. This is the primary antibody which is bonded already to this uh, immobilized antigen and the secondary antibody has something called an enzyme which is actually conjugated to the secondary antibody. Okay. Now, with this kind of an orientation again you wash off those secondary antibodies which are not bound and you have only the bound specimens here uh, onto the surface of the plate and then you put something called uh, which, which can change color on uh, coming in contact with this, uh, this enzyme of interest. Okay. So, this is called a chromogen. So, in this case you are dropping a material, a chromogen into this plate where as soon as this chromogen comes in contact with the enzyme here, the color of the chromogen changes. You can see there is a change in coloration from blue to green. Okay. Now, assuming that there were no antibodies in the patient's serum at the very beginning here, so there would be hardly any bound antibodies onto the surface due to which the enzymes will not bind in turn to the immobilized antigens. Okay, because the secondary antibody can only bind to the primary antibody, the red antibody. So, the absence of red would mean that these would be all free and they would be washed off and there would be hardly anything which can change the color of the chromogen. So, the, if there is a change in the chromogen, it kind of reflects the, uh, the, the concentration of the secondary antibody in, you know, in the patient's blood and uh, sorry, the primary antibody in the patient's blood which is also an indication of how badly or you know how worsely the patient has been afflict, affected or inflicted. So, with this I would like to round up the first uh, lecture and uh, in the next uh, session we would discuss a little more details on how the other aspects of sensor design can be uh, you know illustrated or, or studied in details. So, thank you.